Hey there! Did you know Baker's always gives you savings and rewards on top of our lower than low prices? And when you download the Baker's app, you'll enjoy over $500 in savings every week with digital coupons. And don't forget fuel points to help you save up to $1 per gallon at the pump. Want to save even more? With a Boost membership, you'll get double fuel points and free delivery. So shop and save big at Baker's today. Baker's, fresh for everyone. Savings may vary by state. Restrictions apply. See site for details. Dreaming of a better sleep? Tossing and turning is not your destiny. And Ollie is here to help. Ollie invites you to sink into sweet, sweet slumber to improve your mental and physical health and overall wellness. More than just melatonin, Ollie's ingredients help you unwind your mind for a delightfully dreamy drift off. Sleep is on the way at Ollie.com. That's O L L Y.com. In celebration of Women's History Month, this episode of This Week in Royal History will exclusively highlight remarkable women. During this special month, we will not only recognize the birthdays and commemorate the deaths of these women, but also delve into their inspiring life stories and significant contributions to history. Get ready to learn about some truly amazing figures. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Imagine stepping back in time to the lavish court of Georgian England, a world of intrigue, politics, and royal scandal. It's the year 1749, and the 19th of March marks the birth of a young princess, Louisa Anne, the daughter of Frederick, Prince of Wales, and Augusta of Saxe-Gotha. Her birthplace is Leicester House, an opulent mansion in the heart of London, where the finest nobility gather to celebrate this momentous occasion. But Louisa's life is far from the fairy tale that one might imagine for a royal princess. Despite her privileged upbringing and illustrious family connections, she is plagued by poor health from an early age. Her delicate constitution casts a shadow over her future, and as she grows older, it becomes clear that her prospects for marriage and a happy life are limited. Despite her frailty, Louisa is a remarkable young woman, beloved by her family and close friends. Her sister, in particular, is a constant companion, and together they share a deep bond that transcends their royal status. As the years pass, Louisa's condition worsens, and by the time she's a young woman, she is confined to her sickbed, an invalid whose life is marked by pain and suffering. But even in her darkest moments, she remains a symbol of strength and resilience, a reminder that even in the most trying circumstances, there is always hope and courage. Sadly, Louisa's life is cut short, and at just 19 years old, she passes away at Carlton House in London. Her death is a blow to her family and the wider royal court who mourn her passing and pay tribute to her memory. Today, her legacy lives on, remembered as a young woman whose grace, courage, and resilience inspired those around her. Her final resting place is Westminster Abbey, where she lies in peace, a testament to the enduring spirit of the human soul. It's the year 1469, and in the heart of London's Westminster Palace, a young princess is born. Her name is Cecily, and she is the daughter of Edward IV and Elizabeth Woodville, a royal couple whose influence stretches across the entire country. As Cecily grows up, she is immersed in the world of royalty, with connections to no less than eight of England's kings and queens. Her position as daughter, sister, and aunt to the most powerful figures in the land grants her a unique perspective on the courtly machinations and political intrigues of the time. But Cecily's life is not without its trials and tribulations. Betrothed twice in her youth to princes of Scotland, her father's sudden death in 1483 changes her life forever. Declared illegitimate by her uncle, Richard III, along with her siblings, including her brother, Edward V. 
Cecily's future is uncertain. Despite these setbacks, Cecily perseveres. She marries John Wells, a staunch Lancastrian and half-brother to Henry VII's mother, in 1487. Together, they have two daughters, but tragedy strikes when both girls die young. John's death, in 1499, leaves Cecily grieving, but she finds solace in her role at court. Cecily becomes involved in various royal ceremonies, including attending her sister's coronation and carrying the train of Catherine of Aragon at her wedding to Prince Arthur. But her life takes a dramatic turn when she marries Thomas Kime of Lincolnshire, a squire of low birth. Henry VII, furious at this alliance, banishes Cecily from court and confiscates her estates. Despite the turmoil, Cecily remains resilient, and Margaret Beaufort, Henry's mother, allows her and Thomas to reside at her property, Collyweston Palace. Cecily's life ends when she passes away on the Isle of Wight in 1507. Now let's flash forward a century to the Elizabethan era, a time of religious turmoil and political intrigue. Meet Anne Daiquiri a young girl born into a family of nobles in the north of England on the 21st of March, 1557. After the untimely death of her father and mother, Anne is raised by her devout Catholic grandmother, where she receives a religious education from a Catholic priest. Despite being surrounded by a Protestant court, Anne boldly converts to Catholicism and marries Philip Howard, a fellow Catholic. However, their faiths put them in danger, and they both end up under house arrest. Anne gives birth to a son while Philip is imprisoned in the Tower of London, but tragically, he never gets to meet his son, as he died in the Tower. Anne is left to raise their child alone and struggles financially, being denied her inheritance. But through it all, Anne Daiquiri remains true to her faith and love, for her family. Let's travel forward in time to the late Tudor and Stuart eras of England, a time of great change, upheaval, and royal intrigue. It's the year 1590, and in the heart of Yorkshire's Skipton Castle, a young princess is born. Her name is Anne, and she is the only surviving child of George Clifford, 3rd Earl of Cumberland and Lady Margaret Russell. Her parents live separately after losing their two elder sons, leaving Anne as the sole heir to her father's titles and estates. As a child, Anne captures the attention of Queen Elizabeth I, who takes a special interest in the young lady. She dances in masks with Anne of Denmark, the queen consort to James I of England, and becomes known for her grace intelligence, and charm. Anne's life takes a dramatic turn when she marries Richard Sackville, 3rd Earl of Dorset, in 1609. They have five children, but only two daughters survive to adulthood. After Richard's death in 1624, Anne marries again, this time to Philip Herbert, 4th Earl of Pembroke, and 1st Earl of Montgomery, in 1630. Although they do not have any children together, their union is a happy one, and they enjoy a long and loving relationship. Anne's life is not without its challenges, however. Despite being the sole surviving child of her father, she is excluded from inheriting the Earldom of Cumberland, which instead passes to her uncle. It's not until her cousin dies without male heirs in 1643 that Anne finally inherits her father's estates in Westmoreland. As a wealthy landowner, she becomes known for restoring churches in her territories and expanding her family's castles. Prepare to journey forward in time to the Victorian era of England, an age of a remarkable transformation and progress, when a young princess shall be born in the prestigious Kensington Palace. Her name was Victoria Mary Augusta Louise Olga Pauline Claudine Agnes. But to the world, 
she would be known as Queen Mary, one of the most beloved and influential queens in British history. As a child, Mary of Tech enjoyed a privileged upbringing, playing with her royal cousins and spending time with her family in their elegant London home. But tragedy struck when she became engaged to Prince Albert Victor, the eldest son of the Prince of Wales, only for him to die six weeks later during an influenza pandemic. In the midst of her grief, Mary found solace in the arms of Albert's younger brother, Prince George, Duke of York. They fell in love and were married in a lavish ceremony at St. James's Palace in 1893. Little did they know then that they would go on to become one of the most beloved and iconic royal couples in British history. Throughout her long and storied life, Mary of Tech proved to be a true champion of the people, dedicating herself to charity work and supporting her husband, King George V, during World War I. She rationed food at the palace and visited servicemen at hospitals, earning the respect and admiration of the British people. As George's reign drew to a close, Mary remained a steadfast and loyal advisor helping him with his speeches and offering her insights on history and royalty. Tragically, Mary of Tech's life was marked by loss and heartbreak. But her legacy endures to this day, a testament to her enduring strength, grace, and compassion. Queen Mary, Mary of Tech, died on the 24th of March, 1953 just 10 weeks before the coronation of her granddaughter, Queen Elizabeth II. She was the first English-born queen consort since Catherine Parr, wife of Henry VIII, and her influence and impact on British history will never be forgotten. Imagine traveling back in time to the 13th century, a time of knights, castles, and royal alliances. It's the year 1242 in Bordeaux, France. A baby girl is born to the king and queen of England. Her name is Beatrice, and she will go on to become a key player in the intricate politics and powerful struggles of medieval Europe. Growing up in a royal household, Beatrice was surrounded by her siblings, including her beloved younger sister, who tragically passed away at a young age. But as she grew older, Beatrice became a force to be reckoned with in her own right. In 1260, at the age of 17, Beatrice married John de Drew, heir to the Duchy of Brittany, in a strategic move that helped to form an alliance between England and France. Their union brought the earldom of Richmond under English control, cementing Beatrice's place in the complex web of medieval politics. Over the years, Beatrice and John had six children, and she proved to be a devoted wife and mother, committed to her family and her duties as a member of the royal court. But tragically, Beatrice's life was cut short when she passed away in London in 1275. Despite her accomplishments, she was never officially styled as Duchess of Brittany, as her husband only became Duke after her death. Today, Beatrice is remembered as a key player in the intricate politics and power struggles of medieval Europe, a woman who played a pivotal role in the alliances and relationships that shaped the course of history. She was buried at Greyfriars Church in London, her legacy a testament to the enduring power and influence of medieval queens and princesses who shaped the world we know today. And that concludes this week in royal history. This episode is always so much fun to do, and I hope you're able to take something away from it today. Until next time, I'm Rebecca Larson. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty. 